So we set the targets. This with a minus 70% reduction and engaged with the whole organization. And the understanding was really there that, whoa, if we are to reach this target, we really need to work in a different way. And we need to figure out how we're going to do this. Welcome to the Shipping Podcast, where I meet interesting maritime professionals sharing their passion for the shipping industry and their everyday job. I am your host. My name is Lena Gosberg. Hello, Shipping Podcast listeners, and welcome to episode 235. In this episode, I have the pleasure of speaking with Elizabeth Munk, the head of sustainability IKEA supply chain operations. Since 2016, Elizabeth has led the sustainability agenda in supply chain operations, where she's focusing on reaching ambitious global transportation and logistics climate targets. Cargo owners buying transport have become more important now as they have the power to influence all modes of transport. They are closer to the consumer and they are working strategically to reduce their footprint. I hope you will enjoy our conversation. This is Elizabeth Munk for you. Every conversation matters. Welcome to the Shipping Podcast. Could you please introduce yourself? Nice to be here, Lena. Thank you very much for inviting me. So my name is Elizabeth Munk and I lead sustainability in IKEA supply chain operations, and I'm based in Switzerland outside of Basel. And what is your background? How did you end up where you are today? Well, sustainability has always been my passion from when I was quite young. I've always been interested in it, worked with it. So when I studied, I, I have a background Master of Law, studied environmental legislation, environmental law, and then I have a Master of Science in Environmental Management and Policies. And then I've been working with sustainability throughout my career in different constellations. And I think my drive is to be a catalyst of positive change, engaging people in this very important topic that sustainability is all about. Mm. And your job in IKEA. What do you do when you are in charge of the supply chain operations? I have a super exciting job. I love my job. But in supply chain operations, maybe I should tell a little bit of what we are doing and what we are responsible for. So we are responsible for the global transportation and logistics of IKEA home furnishing products. And that is from the suppliers to the warehouses and stores. So we we do transportation on land by trucks, by rail, and overseas, ocean shipping. We do short sea, we do barge, and then we do the warehousing of of the products. And we're a big global shipper. We do about 1.7 million shipments a year total. And we emit about, from that part, about 1 million tons of greenhouse gas emissions. So, of course, we have a big responsibility and also a big opportunity to actually influence in in a positive way. So what we are aiming for then with these transportation and logistics is about clean and fair goods flow. And what we mean by when we say clean is that we are aiming for zero emission transportation and to use 100% renewable electricity and energy across our supply chain. And when we talk about fair, it's about the working conditions for the many thousands of people working and touching our goods in our supply chain to have good and fair working conditions, but also to have a positive impact in the communities that are also touched by our goods flow. So, uh, yeah, when we say zero emissions, to, to support us on this journey, we have um, joined something called COSEV, Cargo Owners for Zero Emission Vessels. And that is that we've committed to only ship our goods on zero emission vessels by 2040. And the same goes for when we're using 
heavy duty trucks on land, we joined something called EV100 Plus, which is also an initiative, and that is committed to only use zero emission heavy duty trucks when we are transporting on land, also latest by 24. But we also have a very important milestone already in 2030, which is just around the corner. And that is to reduce the emission from every transport that we do by an average of minus 70% wow. compared to the baseline year of fiscal year 70. So that is, a, is the journey we are on. And how far have you reached on that journey? We really have a lot of focus on this. And from fiscal year 17 to the fiscal year 23, we have reduced the average emissions by minus 25%. So we are definitely on our way. We know that the agenda we have in place, it's working, and there's still such a long way to go. Good thing is that we have an organization that is very much on board on this journey and committed to this journey. We also know that we need to collaborate across because we can. You, we need collaborations to make this happen. We, we don't have any trucks or vessels, our own vessels or trucks. We are buying these services from our service providers and different suppliers. So it's, you know, the scope three emissions. So how we are to reach this target, it's completely dependent on how our service providers are on board on this and that we are making this journey together. When you started in 2017, where did you start? How did you start? The very first time, I mean, in IKEA, we've been working with sustainability for many, many years and also in, in transportation. But what we started with, what happened in 2016-17 was really to put the spotlight on transportation and logistics. What we started with, we had uh, have measured the CO2e emissions, etc. But what we focused on was really to go much more in detail to the CO2e emissions, uh, to really understand the magnitude of the footprint, the details around the footprint. Then we set targets. So we set the targets. This with a minus seventy percent reduction, and engaged with the whole organization and the understanding was really there that whoa if we are to reach this target we really need to work in a different way and we need to figure out how we're going to do this so we put what we call our decarb agenda in place and that is a very simple approach on how to work with this it's to reduce replace and rethink where reduce is about we need to work with efficiencies always working with continuous improvement in everything that we do. So that's step by step, every small step counts towards getting more efficient. And with that, you would reduce the actual emissions, but you also reduce cost by working with this. So that is one part. And it's about working with fill rates, equipment utilizations, fuel efficiency measures, optimizing the networks, etc. Always working with that. The second part is about replace. Replace fossil fuels with better alternatives. So, for example, we are focusing a lot on intermodal solutions, putting as much as we can on rail, short sea and barge. And right now we have more than 50% of our ton kilometers on intermodal solutions. And we also know by doing that, immediately, we cut the footprint in half compared to using a normal diesel truck. So there is a lot of potential just switching the modes of, of how you transport things. So that's one thing. We also use biofuels. We use biofuels in ocean. We do not see this as the ultimate solution. We need to go towards zero emissions, but we also need to reduce emissions here and now. It's so important. What we do today is so important. We cannot wait and make the actions, you know, in the future when all the solutions are out there. We need to reduce emissions here now. So in ocean, we actually use now quite a lot of biofuels. So uh, with the latest tender that we did, we will reduce the footprint from the ocean shipping part with about 30%. So that's important. Then. 
if we go into the rethink part, it is about integrating new types of solutions and technologies and fuels into our supply chain. There are lots of solutions out there, but it's not only about innovation and rethinking the technical solutions, it's also about how we collaborate. So I often say that we need innovation in collaboration, <laughs> finding new ways to work together across supply chains to deploy and scale up with speed and efficiency. That is really important because of the, also the urgency of the climate crisis. That is really, really necessary. So that is what we are focusing on. I'm amazed and I'm so happy that I met you and I can listen to you saying those things because I've always been on the other side, you know, the ship owners, no, it's impossible. No, it's too expensive. No, we can't do this. I see change coming along now, but, but how was you, how were you received when you started talking about this with the ship owners and the managers of the ships? I think. Where we are today in the world, I, I believe the, the understanding of the urgency of this topic is really out there. I think the willingness to do something about it is definitely there. Um, I think uh, so we collaborate a lot uh, with the shipping lines that we work with, with the transport service providers that we work with, because with, with IKEA and the success of IKEA is very much the integrated supply chain because it's it's how we work together with our suppliers and how it's and it's not about us coming with clear prerequisite requirement this you need to do it's in the collaboration where the amazing things happen when you co-create things together when you go above and beyond and you find new solutions that you can scale and you can share the good examples throughout the supply chain. There is something really happening in, in, in those meetings. And I think that is also very much what is needed now in times of climate crisis is about finding these new constellations and be open to collaborative approaches. And I think that also the understanding of that is really, really out there. And now we need a lot of innovation in, in how we collaborate so that we can scale the new solutions. But if you look upon the various parts of the supply chain, how are we doing there? The maritime part, <laughs> the one on the sea? I think for, for transportation uh, overall, I would say both for land and ocean transportation, they are both sectors that are considered hard to abate because of, of the complexity of actually, there are so many parts in these supply chains that need to come together with infrastructure, with the production of energy, the large investments that needs to be done, et cetera. So, so it's not something that is done you know, overnight. These are long cycles. So I think, again, I think there is a lot that needs to be done. There's a lot of challenges now or it, that needs to be overcome within the coming years here. But I think, again, the understanding is there, the willingness is there. It is now about how quick can we be to make this change? How fast can we do this? And also, I think because of the complexities in, in these supply chains, it's also very much about, when it comes to collaboration, about building the trust and confidence that this is the direction, that the, the trust is there to be able to make the investments that are necessary in order to make the transformation. So I think that it's something that really is building now. And then I hope there will be this big wave that will, you know, make it where everybody comes on board because that is also needed. It's not just a few that can be on this journey. It's, you know, all the players and actors need to be on board to make this system change that is, that is needed. Yes, I totally agree with you. And, and I can see, I mean, there is a new generation coming into our industry. Or it should be because we need them. A lot of people are retiring and, and not working anymore. So we need young people to replace them <laughs> and to develop our industry. Yes, and and they are they have a total different mindset when they enter into our industry, which is great because I think we need it. Yes, absolutely. 
I think you're touching upon something so important here. And, and we see, for example, ac across the transportation sector, not just ocean, but also the land, we see a super shortage of, of drivers, for example. Many going into retirement, not that many young people interested into going into the profession. We also have a very low gender diversity in, in the sector. There are lots of opportunities here. I think with the transformation that is happening now, there's something exciting also happening here. New opportunities, new types of professions going forward. And I think it's so important to have the discussions around this and try to assess and pinpoint and see what can we actually do and what is happening in the industry. For, for example, if we look at electrification of land transportation, uh, when we are working with, with using more and more intermodal, doing the longer stretches on rail, for example, which opens up shorter pre and on carriage routes, which makes it that maybe you don't need to be on the road for as long as previously as a driver. You can have this as a more normal and go home after work to your friends and family. It opens up new opportunities. And it's also highlighting these opportunities to, to young people because even if there will be lots of autonomous driving, whatever will come in the future, we will still need people in the industry, but maybe it will look a little bit different. But it's about sharing the opportunities, discussing these opportunities to um, engage and encourage young people to get into this industry. I started this podcast almost nine years ago to, to make the maritime industry more visible and more interesting for young people, because young people at that time started to hang out and listen to podcasts and we were not there. I was the first one to start a podcast in the shipping industry. And I think still some people need to hear what the young people think about our industry and what they can come into our industry and contribute with. Yes. Because, uh, yeah, we are some old fashioned industry and, and a little bit stale in a way, sort of we are still, this is the way we've always done it. But I think that the leaders who actually listen to people, this is another way to do things. Those who listen to that can actually gain even more. Uh, and uh, I hear a lot of young people who say to me, Lena, it's so good that you are saying all these things because no one listens to me. I'm too young for people to listen to. And that is sad in a way. Yes. And how important is that, that the listening part, we have to share, we have to discuss. That's the way forward, for sure. It's the only way. Yeah. But do you see any... Do you see any progress? Where is the progress except for IKEA then? <laughs> I think it is about having the discussion. I can maybe talk about here. Iway is an important part of what we do. It's our um, IKEA ways of working. It's our supply code of conduct, but it's a way of how we uh, work with the, the people, the worker, the environment, the child, and also animals actually in the supply chain. This is something that IKEA introduced in the year 2000, this code of conduct is continuously being updated. So what we have just done, we actually worked on the part for ocean shipping and for seafarers. And during the pandemic, it, it became very clear, you know, the, the industry and the situation for the seafarers, etc. So it's something we put the spotlight on also to look at what can we, what can, how can we be part of influence and ensuring good conditions for seafarers, et cetera. So we've updated this part of our um, highway code of conduct, and we are now in the way of launching it to all of, of the shipping lines and having discussions with the shipping lines around it. So that is something because it is important that this topic is on the agenda, always in the discussions with our suppliers and service providers, that there is this ongoing dialogue and also to pick up where do we have good examples to share with others. And it's, it's only in the dialogues, I would say, that um, a real change can take place because it's not just about setting requirements. It's about that we all need to be on board on this journey and have an idea of where are we heading? What is it that we want to achieve? 
What kind of industry is it that we want to work in, all of us? What does that look like? And to have that discussion ongoing at all times. Can you share something about what you have been looking at when it comes to seafarers? Yes, it's working conditions. It's about uh, ensuring also the gender diversity part that the preconditions are in place on board a ship, for example, to, to enable for everyone to be able to, to work in a good way. So there are lots of different parts in the highway section covering all of the different parts of human rights, etc. But what we've done now is kind of put the spotlight specifically on, on the ocean part. So we are going then to launch it right now. Well, that is great news, I think. There was so much work done by seafarers during the pandemic. I mean, yes. we were sitting at home and they were working. Amazing. Mm. Absolutely. The heroes, I would say, to enable a whole of our society to keep going. Amazing. And how how clear it became during that time, how important, because that is often the case when everything is just working, you don't see it. It's just part of normal everyday life. But in that situation, it was just very, very clear. Yeah, I, I think it was, I think we have a momentum now to show it, uh, to, to actually focus on that because everyone realized that, as you say, during the pandemic, uh, just grab the opportunity to become more visible. The industry needs to become more visible. And I mean, I'm amazed that there are so many people who have that task to actually make this industry more visible, but I don't see much of it. I know that there is a lot of discussions and talks going around behind closed doors. Of course, it needs to be done there as well. But the young people don't have the access to the closed doors and we need them now. I mean, it takes four years to build a ship, but it takes six years to build an officer. Yes. So we need to have a little bit of both at the moment. So uh, what does the future look like? What do you see in the future? Where are we heading? Regarding the climate uh, part, regarding the industry part, I mean, the, I think there is so much movement going on at, at this point in time. If we look at the climate agenda, for example, I think where we need to head, where society needs to head is that we need to make the transformation as fast as possible. That is, that is I would say, the immediate task we need to, to, to focus on. And, and I think from our part, we are doing, we have very clear targets. We are working towards it. We have, it's very operational as it is now. Uh, and also, uh, I think, I think we, are, we are definitely making progress and the momentum is there. So I think we are heading in the right direction. And I'm a very optimistic person. Uh, <laughs> I do believe we can make a change. It's definitely possible. And it's, it's all about people. It's all about the mindset and the change willingness to make this happen. And also, I think when you so clearly go towards a target, it's also that there are these other things that are coming along the way. Like, for example, the social part of, of this agenda, the just transition to highlight what can I, where, where are also the opportunities in this. Just transition is about how we go into this new decar world and not to leave anyone behind. But with this transformation comes so many possibilities and potentials. So I think it's so important to have the discussions around this now, identify this scale where it's possible and, and really identify the opportunities. So I think that is also one of the parts. I think also with the so many topics coming up also when it comes to, for example, biodiversity, which is also a topic that is so many, the ecosystems as, as such, I think also the ocean as, as an ecosystem, the importance of the oceans is also coming up strong and more and more into discussions right now, which I think is super good and very much needed. Thank you, Elizabeth. I'm so grateful that you took the time to speak to me. Who would you like to listen to? Who do you think I should interview the next? First of all, I think there are so many interesting people in this industry. And there's, there are so many people with so much passion in 
different topics in this industry. One, if I would pick one person, I would actually uh, suggest you talk to Madad McLean, that is uh, the general secretary of an organization called CESTAS, Zero Emission Ship Technology Association. She, to me, is a true, uh, what we say in Swedish, fire soul, el shell, <laughs> with really a passion of what she's doing to promote zero emission ocean shipping and ocean vessels. So I suggest talk to her. Okay, I will see what I can do. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Thank you. And uh, I hope to see you in real life soon again. Same, likewise. Every conversation matters. Thank you, Elizabeth, for your positive approach to sustainability. This week, the IKEA Supply Chain Operations Decarb Catalog was released. I have read it. It's an excellent example of how to work with sustainability strategically and systematically. There will be a link in the show notes to this episode for those of you who want to learn more. Before I leave you, however, I would like to thank those of you who have replied to the Shipping Podcast audience survey. You helped me a lot. Until the next time, from me to you, over and out. Thank you for listening to the Shipping Podcast. Don't forget to tell everyone that you meet that there is a Shipping Podcast available and that they should download it and listen to the maritime professionals who are sharing their passion for the shipping industry. 